Ma'am, shall we start? Ma'am, shall we start, ma'am? shall we start yes can you hear me ma'am yeah i can hear you okay. good morning to one and all present here today we are going to see a topic of uh, scope of kiloscopy and advancements and uh, our guest speaker is from uh, uh, like savata dental college dr t n uma maheshwari professor and head of admin um, department of oral medicine and radiology savata dental college and uh, she uh, she was a well versed uh, person in uh, forensic odontology and she got a uh, publications of 135 publications and uh, books uh, among 3 uh, and she is expert in liprent uh, liprens and its uh, advancements and she have guided so many students in ug and pg projects and she got recently she got the excellence awards for award in forensic odontology we welcome you ma'am thank you and uh, at this moment i would like to thank uh, dr abhirami for giving me an opportunity to share my knowledge and research experience in the field of kiloscopy and warm greetings to all the delegates from savita dental college and hospital savita university i am here to share my knowledge which i had gained for a period of 16 years involving in the field of kiloscopy i started my thesis topic on liprin and this gave me a chance to know about kiloscopy and to explore more in the field of kiloscopy as it was very scanty at the time when i started doing my research on kiloscopy the research work on liprint was scanty and that made us to explore and find out what else can we utilize this liprints in the field of forensic odontology emphasizing the importance as forensic odontologists to know how the kiloscopy can be helpful in personal identification and criminalization so in the following slides we'll be only seeing the research experience which i had gathered over a period of 16 years from the start of my pg thesis on liprins it is important to do, to know the basic knowledge about forensic before going into kiloscopy and forensic is a latin word which means court of law forensic odontology started almost in 66 ad when princess agrippina wanted to identify whether lolia was declared dead or not she was identified as uh, the dead person only with the help of the upper anterior teeth so from the period of 66 ad forensic odontology came into existence and in 1193 the first forensic dental identification made in india was in the uh, dead case of raja rathur jaychand of kanunaj was declared dead by identifying this false anterior teeth adolf hitler was considered as the first person to involve dental identification post mortem identification comparing it with anti mortem record but father of forensic odontology is dr oscar omeda because he was a first person to establish a department of forensic odontology in the world it was set in japan almost 50 years ago in tokyo dental college as forensic odontologist it is important for us to be familiar with the definition defined by the federation dental international as a branch of dentistry which in the interest of justice deals with proper handling 
an examination of dental evidence and with the proper evaluation and presentation of dental findings. And this was a definition devised by Kaiser Nielsen in the year 1970, and it still holds good. It is also important for us to be familiar with a lot of organizations which are associated with forensic odontology. We have our own Indian Association of Forensic Odontology, Bureau of Legal Dentistry, American Board of Forensic Odontology, American Society of Forensic Odontology, and you have an international organization for forensic odontostomatology. And there are a lot of societies like British Association for Forensic Odontology, Australian Society of Forensic Odontology. So each of them are involved in the field of forensic odontology, emphasizing the importance of dental surgeons in forensic science. So the main scope of forensic odontology involves personal identification, civil litigations, and criminal investigations. In personal identification, it, it includes both age determination, sex determination, stature, and ethnicity of the population. Similarly, in civil litigation, it includes the malpractice, the dental neglect involved in dental practice will be covered under civil investigations. Criminal investigations identifying the suspect using either lip prints or rugae markings or teeth prints is one of the important uh, criteria which as forensic odontologists, we need to be familiar, knowledgeable and update our knowledge what are the advancements in all these three fields, which are the important scope of forensic odontology. Again, as applications of forensic odontology, apart from theoretical knowledge, it is important that it is really helpful in personal identification in situations like natural mass disasters, like earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, and landslides in man-made, disasters mainly in bomb blasts because nobody can forget the important bomb blast in the history when Dr. I mean, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated. The forensic odontologist played a very important role in identifying the dead body. Similarly, in identification of suspects, because all of us know that fingerprints is quite popular and everybody will try to hide their fingerprints. In such incidents, these lip prints picked out from any crime scenes will be very helpful in identifying the suspect. And kiss marks or lip prints are very important compared to fingerprints in identifying the suspects. So personal nature and ethnicity. As forensic odontologists, we need to be again familiar with what are the various methods used in each of these personal identification tools. In age identification, we must remember that there is chronological age, skeletal age, which is dependent upon the ossification centers of the bone. And dental age is always uh, I mean, accepted because we have different teeth erupting at different age range, which will help us in identifying the age of an individual. So most of the criminal cases, dental age identification and issuing a dental age certificate is very important evidence in crime scenes. Similarly, in sex identification, there are various bones, skeletal remains, pelvis, skull, femur, tibia, ulna, radius, vertebrae, sternum, metacarpal, metatarsal, and also our teeth will also help in differentiating whether the suspect individual or the personal identification of a person, of a deceased person is either a male or a female. Similarly, the long bones of the lower extremity, humerus, halna, and radius play an important role using the anatomical method and mathematical formulas are available to identify the stature. Similarly, the ethnicity, 
based on the nasal opening, zygomatic bones, maxillary bones, proximal and distal end of femur, and again, our teeth plays a very important role, apart from all the long bones. The heart tissue structure of our oral cavity teeth seems to be the main role in identifying the ethnicity also. So personal identification is establishing the identity of an individual. Dental identity has been defined by Acharya and Taylor as a total of all characteristic of teeth and their associated structures, while not individually unique, but when considered together will definitely provide a uniqueness and helps in personal identification. So personal identification plays a major role in social as well as in medical legal purpose. Before going into lip prints, it is important as academicians, as well as, as clinicians working in private hospital or a private dental care, or even in a private institutions or government institutions, we should have the sole responsibility of maintaining all our records of patients because they serve as an important anti-mortem record. The case history documentation either done manually or in on electronic database, the dental cast, which we take impressions and preserve these casts for prosthetic purpose, they also serve as a very important anti-mortem record. The photographs of the patient, the both intraoral and extraoral radiographs of the patient, along with lip print and bite registrations, the rugae markings, which can be received from the photographs, as well as from the dental cast, the teeth samples, the extracted teeth samples can also be preserved. And all these serve as a different forms of anti-mortem record, which may be useful in future in comparing with the post-mortem, as well as which may be useful even when an individual is hiding his identity to identify the suspects in crime scenes, especially these teeth marks and lip prints are very important in many of these sexual harassment cases. So what do a forensic odontologist do once a crime scene is reported? Or what is the uh, steps which they follow? Is the first thing is they should know and be familiar that there is a performer which will be recording the demographic data as well as the dental status of the patients, which need, can be compared if available, if these dental status are available or the anti-mortem record is available, it can be compared with the existing post-mortem findings. And there are now different softwares which has been evolved like Identify, Odented, CapMe and IDIS, which the forensic odontologists are trying to explore and use these softwares for making their anti-mortem and post-mortem record comparison more easier as well as to document these findings. So now let's move on to keloscopy, which is a Greek word meaning lips and scopy is examination or study. So study of characteristic pattern of elevations and depressions found on the labial mucosa is keloscopy. And lip prints are normal lines and fissures, which are in the form of wrinkles and grooves, as you see, present on the upper and lower lip. And they are almost in the zone of transition, that is between the inner labial mucosa and the outer skin. The wrinkles and grooves on the labial mucosa, called as sulci labiorum, form a characteristic pattern called lip prints. It is again important to know how this field of keloscopy started evoluting. Like in the period of 1902, Fisher was the first anthropologist who noticed that these markings on the lip are not only for aesthetic concern, they do play an important role in anthropology. Edmund Lockhart in the year 1932 found that these lip print markings can also be utilized not only as a personal identification tool, but also in criminalization. 1950s, a lot of researchers started devising a classification to classify these lip print, just like how we have classification for fingerprints. In 1967, the classification devised by Santos was considered as the most simple classification for beginners. Then the research started 
evoluting. And finally, 1974, Yashu Shushikashi devised a classification based on his research experience in collecting a lot of Lipran samples from Japanese population. And his classification till date is considered as a standard classification and most easier and familiar classification, which belongs to Liprins of any races and ethic. So the evolution of keloscopy is initially the researchers in keloscopy was trying to classify and first attempt to form a classification so that that can be used for typing of leprins. And after that, the research started evolving in personal identification and criminalization, how these leprin markings can be proved to be unique and can be utilized for identifying the diseased person or for a person who's, who's trying to hide their identity. And now in 20 and 21st century, we are trying to use these lip prints as a biometric device, just like how fingerprints have been used in many of the biometric applications. So similarly, as forensic odontologists, we need to bring in the importance of lip print as a biometric device. So the forensic applications of keloscopy in particular is that just like other forensic tools or other personal identification tool, keloscopy, since it remains permanent for, a for an individual from the beginning of life till end, it can be used as a personal identification tool. And since it is unique from, um, and it is having its own characteristic patterns in different individuals, it can be definitely utilized in lifting these lip prints from the, I mean, non-biological materials, just like how the fingerprints are traced and can be compared with the suspect and identifying the criminal. So let's see how the research was evolved in proving the significance of lip prints in, all, in both personal identification and criminalization. It is also important to know the history behind these lip prints in suspects identification. Earlier in 1966, there was a case which was reported that in the crime scene that these lip prints were being lifted up and was helpful in identifying the case, the persons who were involved in burglary. Similarly, in 1970, lip prints were lifted up from the envelope covers and proved that the suspects were not the person who were involved in a particular crime scene. In 1988, there was a burglary case where they had able to lift lip prints from a piece of cake and found that the tooth prints and the lip prints together served as an important identification tool for identifying the suspect who was involved in the burglary case. So this proves that lip print applications uh, like fingerprints have been proved in many civil and criminal cases to identify the suspect. Now let's know the methodology because as researchers, many of them who want to involve in lip print tracing, you should know what are the different materials which can be used for tracing the lip prints successfully from all individuals. It is important that any debris collection on the lips definitely have to be removed using a sterile cotton or a wet cotton and remove the any debris from the lips before applying lipstick or any other staining material to collect the lip prints from the individuals. Lip print tracing can be done using a tracing paper or a cellophane tape, which can be applied over the stained lips of an individual. And after about a period of one minute, it has to be removed gently so that you don't alter the lip prints. And then initially, a magnifying glass was sufficient enough to classify and do the typing of lip print in each quadrant. The classification devised by Santos in the year 1966 was only two classification. He classified lip prints as simple type and composite type. Simple type is further classified as straight line, curved line, angled line and a sign shaped line based on the appearance. The composite are those which doesn't have only a groove but also have a fork. So though, depending upon the 
a morphological appearance of the folk, whether it was bifurcated, trifurcated, or irregular. If you're not able to give a particular shape or we are not able to distinctly say whether it is bifurcated or trifurcated, then it belongs to a category called irregular. But this classification was not uh, commonly followed by many of the researchers. It was its own classification device based on the population of uh, leprints which he had collected. And then later we had another classification which was a little more complicated when compared to Santos because here we have about 23 types of leprints. And this, as you could see in the slide, the names were just named after the appearance. Like if it looks like an eye, hook, bridge, line, dot, double eye, crossing lines. So based on the appearance, and you can see the appearance also being de depicted here as pictures. So based on this appearance, each of the leprint present in each quadrant was classified according to the appearance. Again, this classification was also not followed commonly by many of the researchers. Then we had in the year 1974, Yashi Shushikashi, who has done his Liprin sampling in more than about 30, uh, 3,000 samples. And he identified the type of Liprin as one to five, which we could see here more clearly. The vertical grooves, this is very important slide for most of the researchers who want to start doing any research on keloscopy. The basics of Yasu Shushikashi's classification is very important to do the classification or typing of liprin for the liprin samples collected by you. So here, type one are vertical grooves running from the upper labial mucosa to the lower labial mucosa. If they are a complete line, it is called type 1. You could see some vertical grooves are not running completely from upper border to lower border, but halfway through. They are called as type 1 dash. And if you have a vertical groove which has a fork along their course, it is called as type 2. So any vertical grooves without fork is type 1 or 1 dash, depending upon whether it is completely running or halfway through. Type two is vertical groove with a fork. Type three are these forks along the vertical grooves, which try to intersect with the neighboring vertical grooves with forks. So giving a, almost an intersecting or a reticulate pattern. And here type four are vertical grooves and horizontal give, giving a fence-like pattern. Type 5, according to Yashi Shushikashi, is a type which cannot be classified as 1, 2, 3, or 4. That uh, morphologically, which you cannot differentiate as 1, 2, is classified as type 5. So let's see how my journey in keloscopy started in the year 2003, including 750 individuals around 308 males and 442 female from the age group of 10 to 60 years. And this again, I want to emphasize, the classification of liprins done before 2003 by any researchers were only quadrant wise. This research was first of its kind to consider the typing of liprins compartment wise. That is the liprin sample was divided along the midline has right half and left half. And each quadrant was further divided into central, middle, and lateral compartment. This was followed both on the right upper as well as in the left upper, like left upper central compartment, left upper middle compartment, left upper lower uh, lateral compartment. Again, in the lower lip, left lower central, left lower middle, left lower lateral on the right side, right lower. So this R and L denotes the side and whether it is upper or lower. And the third one, C, M and L denotes the central, middle or the lateral compartment. So totally the lip print was typed in all 12 compartments, which was not done by the earlier researchers. They had concentrated in typing of lip print quadrant wise, I had done the lip print typing compartment wise. This is very important because future you can understand that this research was a forerunner for many other research to evolve in keloscopy.
So how do we decide the type of lip print? The classification followed by Yashi Shishikashi was considered, that is from one to five. So for each compartment, the maximum number of type present was considered as the type of lip print in that particular compartment. Why I want to specify this here is, this is one of the limitation in telescopy. You will have in a particular compartment, multiple types also. You, it may look like a type three and you can also have vertical grooves or it can also have a vertical groove with a fork. You can also have a multiple uh, circular area with dots resembling like type five also. But the maximum number of Liprin present in each compartment was considered as the type of that particular compartment. For example, if you see here, if you could see a lot of reticulate patterns, so I can consider type three in this portion or in this compartment of upper lip. Similarly, if you could see here also, there's a lot of reticulate patterns present. So I can consider that this lip print, uh, the typing of lip print in left lower medial compartment as type 3. So the presence of maximum number of particular type of lip print in each of the compartment, that is totally 12 compartments, was taken into consideration to classify the lip print. So in the 750 individuals, I could see that the classification given by Yashu Shishikashi was almost present in most of the individuals. Like I could appreciate type 1, as well as type 1 dash lip prints. Type 1 dash lip prints are vertical grooves which are running halfway through. Type 1 are lip prints which has vertical grooves running from the upper border to the lower border completely. Similarly, type 2, there were grooves with fork, vertical grooves with a fork in the course, which was considered as type 2. And to add on, apart from the Yashu Shushikashi's classification, the unique observations which I could come across in my research in the year 2003 was that type two had a lot of subdivisions. That is, there were folks which were in the upward direction, which I classified as type two A. There were folks, see, as you could see here, there was no folk here in the upward direction, but you can appreciate the folk in the downward direction. Similarly, I can't call it as type three because they are not even intersecting. So they are distinct vertical grooves with fork in the downward direction, which I classified as type 2B. And to my surprise, I could see forks in both upward and lower direction, which was considered as type 2C. Yashu Shushikashi in his classification, he had categorized all vertical grooves with fork as type 2. These were the unique observations which I made in my study and I wanted to document these evidences. Similarly, type three are grooves which intersect. That was clearly uh, appreciated in most of the individuals which I had collected both males and female. And here there was no confusion to categorize it as type three because you could see that the folks are almost intersecting each other. In type four, Again, it is a very clear cut morphological differentiation. That is, if you have a vertical groove and a horizontal groove giving a fence like pattern, they are called as type four, according to Yashi Shushikashi. This was also observed in almost most of the 750 individual samples which I had taken. Again, just like type two, in type five, again, I found few unique observations which I want to share with you. The grooves which do not fall into one to four category morphologically was considered as type five according to Yashu Shushikashi's classification in 1974. The observations what I found is I could appreciate a lot of areas where there were not horizontal or vertical grooves as you could see in this picture almost like a circular area with minute dots if you see more clearly. This I classified as type five A. Type 5B, these unique observations were even more interesting and they play a major role, especially in case of criminal identification. You could appreciate there were some areas where you have a horizontal groove and like a very small, minute branching grooves, which I had classified as type 5B. 
leaf-like pattern, which was again not observed or not notified in Yashi Shushikasi's classification. Type 5C, that is, when you have an area where there's only horizontal grooves, but you don't have a vertical grooves to call it as type 4, it doesn't give a fence-like pattern. Again, the grooves are not vertical for me to classify it as type 1. The grooves do not have a fork also for me to classify it as type 2. But I could see some observations where there were some compartments of lip exhibiting only horizontal grooves, which I had classified into type 5 because as per yeah, because the classification which we are following for typing the lip print is Yashi Shushikashi. And according to Yashi Shushikashi, which you are not able to classify from type 1 to 4 to be categorized as type 5. So I brought this into type 5C. So the overall observations uh, in 7 or, uh, 750 individuals uh, really proved that type 2 was maximum in the population where I had taken and type 4 seems to be minimum. Here I would again emphasize, there are a lot of researchers done in different populations, again, in Chennai population itself in different areas. And they had uh, given their own observation as one particular type is maximum and another type is minimum. But my observation is that this cannot be taken into a very serious consideration that one particular type is most common when compared to other type. It, it varies population to population and doesn't have much significance as such in personal identification and criminalization. Lip prints are unique. The characteristic patterns of lip prints in each compartment varies from individual to individual. But classifying and saying that one particular type is common in a particular ethnic population is not that acceptable. Yashi Shushikashi has also done this in a study that he had taken a lip print of known individuals for a period of time for about say one year and two years to find whether they are changing by any chance in the pattern and he proved that there was no change in the pattern of lip print as age advances and I have also done this in my study for completeness for I me mean, like to also to prove the a permanency as well as the personal identification tool of keloscopy can be emphasized when your research has such diversity. Like you need to involve not only in typing of lip print, but also have to include such components in your research, which I want to emphasize for the uh, young researchers who want to involve in keloscopy that include all aspects of personal identification properties so that you can prove the significance of lip prints in personal identification. So my research extended in identifying the lip prints for known individuals for a period of one year and I found that there was no big change. And uh, to prove whether it can be used as a genetic marker or to know whether there is any similarities of lip prints among the family members, I collected lip prints uh, from around 15 family members having either two children or three children. And I found that there were no much similarities of lip prints within the siblings, as well as between the siblings and their parents. There were not much similarity. Lip print of an individual as it is, it's a unique characteristic. I also collected uh, lip prints from about uh, 10 families of uh, twin members. Uh, because Yashi Shushikasi was involved in collecting 18 families, I was able to collect 10 family members having twins. And uh, I've also found that the lip prints between identical and non-identical twins also did not have much similarity. One triplet pair came across in my study and I want, also wanted to find whether there is any similarities of lip prints among the triplets as well as similarities of lip print with that of their parents and I found that there were no similarity of lip prints. So having satisfied that I have done a considerable amount of work of proving the significance of lip print as a unique marker as well as in a personal identification tool, I also wanted to explore its role in criminalization. And uh, most of us will be wondering like whether like fingerprints, whether lip prints can also be used in criminalization. Yes. The vermilion border of the lip has minor salivary glands 
and there are a lot of sebaceous glands and sweat glands because it's in the zone of transition between the inner labial mucosa and outer skin. So the secretion of oil and moisture will definitely help in latent lip prints, which can be collected later from crime scenes. So to prove the significance of lip prints in criminalization with the help of fingerprint experts, I attempted tracing these lip prints from drinking glasses using the fingerprint powder and with the expertization help, I was able to trace lip prints from the drinking glasses and compared with the lip print of an individual who used these glasses and matching was done. But only one thing you have to notice here is the lower lip print was traced accurately. The upper lip print, I was not able to lift those lip prints. And to see whether it is or whether it can be even uh, uh, received or can be lifted from any other non-biological materials which are not transparent. So that is the reason why I wanted to continue the tracing of lip prints in stainless steel tumblers. And I also found that the lip prints, whether it is a transparent or a not transparent material, we were able to clearly lift the lip prints and compare it with the suspect. So lip prints comparison with suspects can definitely help be very helpful in identifying the criminal. And this has been attempted in many robbery cases where the uh, thefts like they will be very uh, very cautious in hiding their fingerprints but they will not be very knowledgeable about lip prints and there are a lot of crime scenes in which the lip prints left on the glass doors uh, which has been involved in uh, lifting these lip prints from the glass doors has definitely been very useful for all the um, forensic persons to identify the suspect. And Jenny Ball, uh, he, she is also another forensic odontologist who's still alive and she's trying to do a lot of research in keloscopy and her concentration is on latent lip prints rather than classifying and typing of lip prints to involve more of application of these lip prints in crime scenes. And uh, she has established that lip prints can be traced from cigarette butts, glass doors, food items like apple, along with the teeth markings, these lip prints will be very useful in identifying the suspect because you're getting two identification tool markings. So which can be compared and give a more possible evidence. Similarly, from clothing as well as from the skin, lip prints can be traced. Then I continued my research since I had unique observations in my MDS thesis study that type two, and type five had a lot of subclassifications, which was not noted by most of the researchers. I was able to notify that because the research or the typing of lip print was done compartment wise. So compared to the other researchers, since the lip print was collected from 12 different portions of lip, uh, this helped me to observe these unique observations, especially in type five and type two. So in type five, I wanted to see whether there are more, whether most of the individuals are exhibiting these uh, subdivisions which I had given as type 5A, B and C, whether they are present in individuals. So I extended my samples to 3,911 and including uh, 1,939 males and 1,972 females, almost an equal uh, concentration of both males and female was included in the study sample. And around 1,745 samples had a lot of type 5 lip prints, which I further started uh, exploring for the subdivisions which I had observed in my earlier studies. And I found a lot of uh, lip print samples with type 5 had circular area with minute dots. And few of the samples had branch-like pattern, I hope you remember, which I showed, a leaf-like pattern with minute branches from the horizontal group was also observed in many samples. Similarly, the last one, that is only the horizontal grooves without any vertical groove, so which cannot be classified as type four, but it can also cannot be classified as one and two because the grooves were horizontal without any vertical grooves were considered as type five C. There were few samples who had such type of patterns also. Again, in type two, fork in the upward direction is considered as type two A, 
type 2b is fork with downward direction and uh, fork with that is vertical grooves with fork in both upward and downward direction is considered as type 2c and in my observations i found that uh, the type 2a that is which was considered as the classification by yashi shishikashi had maximum prevalence when compared to vertical grooves with fork either in the downward direction or vertical grooves with upward and downward fork were even more less prevalent so now all this uh, made me to involve in a peculiar typing of lip print in order to bring this uniqueness of lip print into application we need to have some methodology to first have a particular class of each individual should have one individual number as a lip print number so that this can be used like an anti mortem record in future either for identification or for identifying the suspect who is trying to hide his identity so with this aim since the lip print typing always in compartment wise i collected all the samples which i had uh, collected earlier and involved in doing a typing of lip print so each individual will have a specific number just like how we have our mobile number which is a 10 digit number here each lip print sample will be a will have a 12 digit number again after uh, using lot of uh, softwares i understood that the typing of lip print is definitely unique the combinations what you get will not be repeated again so this proves that the lip print pattern is definitely unique and can be definitely used in future application as a biometric device so this idea i had patented this is called as developing a qr code for each of the lip print sample i started developing a qr code a numerical qr coding and this idea was patented in the year 2018 qr coding of lip prints qr coding of other forensic tools have been attempted by few researchers but this idea i it was patented and it was first of its kind to summarize my research experience on keloscopy which will be helpful for future researchers who want to involve in keloscopy there is no point in proving the lip print as a mean a tool which can helpful in identification of age or identification of sex though few researchers have commented that it can be used for age and sex identification with my research experience over 16 years i could say that lip print is unique in its on its own and it is cannot be used as a genetic marker or a age and sex identification tool lot a lot of researchers especially in the year of 1990s to 2000 had involved in correlating lip print with fingerprint or correlating lip print with dental caries lip print with malocclusion and even lip print with systemic diseases or lip print with oral diseases to find whether there is any correlation to but to my knowledge there is no significant correlation in fact there is no correlation between lip print and fingerprint or lip print with any of the dental pathologies or systemic diseases there's no point in wasting our valuable time in involving in research in such non productive way so what are the limitations of keloscopy which you should bear in mind when you are collecting lip print samples for your research lip pathologies and post surgical scars can change the lip print pattern similarly your application of the staining material most of the time it is going to be lipstick it should be proper and over application again will definitely cause certain alterations in your lip print recordings again in what position are you recording your lip print open mouth position can cause an ill defined lip print when compared to closed mouth again which will cause certain misinterpretation anatomical position of the labial grooves which are very close to the vermilion border is a movable zone so lip prints may, uh, made from those areas you have to be little careful how are you applying pressure because over application of pressure also 
can damage your lip print recordings inter observer variability though it is applicable to all fields of forensic it is also applicable in keloscopy as you could see there are varieties of patterns in one particular compartment even if you are doing the lip print typing compartment wise again in that particular compartment you have multiple types of lip print so which can lead to subject variations in reporting lip prints uh, have to be obtained within 24 hours of time of death to prevent the post mortem changes of the soft tissues there are a lot of devices using the size and shape of the lip that is anthropometric anthropometric analysis of lip is definitely used in biometric devices lip devices are available lip biometric devices are available but lip print utilization in biometric like fingerprints is is really a very challenging research in keloscopy as a small attempt only i started doing the typing of lip prints or coding of lip prints using qr code uh, just like how you are able to read the retinal prints and uh, even the tongue prints just like that i hope even being a sensitive area and recording the lip prints needs a proper sensor development just like how we are able to do it in the fingerprints we need a proper lip print sensor which will be a very challenging and a future scope of our keloscopy to prove the importance of keloscopy like fingerprints lip print biometric is a most challenging one which most of our researchers should be involved in so before concluding i would also like to share that a few publications in uh, both indian and international index journals uh, was very helpful for me to get lot of other researchers who are involved in keloscopy which really helped me in continuing my research even after my pg thesis though the scope was not very high for keloscopy though the applications of keloscopy was very less the research publication at the time when i started my research was very less but now all these publications had helped me to get very good friends and contacts in the field of forensic as well as in keloscopy and uh, which also helped me in getting a lot of cases from foreign countries uh, and uh, they i was involved matching these lip prints which was detected from the crime scene the photographs of the lip prints was uh, i was to see i received these which helped me in uh, involving in criminalization and uh, proving the efficiency of a forensic odontology in the field of forensic and criminal investigation i would also like to introduce this journal which is existing from the year of 2016 with the aim of uh, i mean promoting forensic research and giving a platform for most of the academicians and researchers in the field of forensic odontology our institution is running this journal from 2016 it's a bi annual journal it is google scholar index and we are trying to go for scopus and pubmed indexations so your valuable research findings in forensic odontology can be sent to this journal at this moment i will be failing my duties if i forget to thank my mentor dr nyana sundaram who introduced lip prints in my life and which had brought lot of uh, knowledge fame as well as and research experience of guiding lot of my students so i thank my mentor i thank my university savita university the staffs the students especially my department and now forensic department dr abirami who is involved along with me in many of the research works in forensic so i am very thankful and uh, very happy to share my research experience in this platform any research oriented queries related to keloscopy or forensic odontology i am always ready to help one and all the researchers who want to involve in forensic all your queries i am ready to address if at all you could mail me or whatsapp me i am ready to answer your queries any time when you are involved in the research thank you one and all thank you ma'am thank you for your wonderful session
Ma'am, please close your uh, this one, ma'am. Screen sharing. Ma'am, please take your uh, token of appreciation you, for today's webinar. So Thank you so much. It's a great honor. Yes, ma'am. I, I just, I want, I think one question is there. I'll just, uh, from Ashit, some research papers have shown that diabetic patients have different pattern of lip prints. Yes, diabetic patients, not only diabetic patients, as I was already mentioning in my talk, there are a lot of research carried out in different population comparing not only with uh, diabetic, many systemic disease, but to my knowledge, to my experience, because studying all these articles, I have also tried. And, uh, and for that, there was much correlation with print and these uh, findings. Maybe it can be done, but uh, there is no significant correlation. Maybe there may be some coexisting findings. I do agree. But to my knowledge and research experience in telescopy, I have also involved in correlating uh, studies. The studies, what the researchers have done, I have no comments on it. But my own experience of correlation of lip print with various diseases, in fact, a very famous uh, thing is correlation of lip print with dental caries. But what I feel is lip print should be concentrated in personal identification, criminalization, how to lift lip prints, and how to create a biometric device. This is my personal opinion of what keyloscope. Okay, ma'am. I thank each and everyone where the participants and I like to thank Dr. Uma Maheshwari ma'am for this wonderful session. And I like to, I like to thank uh, Dr. Deepak Nalaswamy sir and our Dean uh, Shija ma'am for this uh, opportunity and they are giving the platform for everyone to present and uh, share the knowledge among everybody. And I like to thank Savita Dental College and the hospitals for uh, helping us to do all this uh, webinars. And yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. If any uh, questions or related queries, you can uh, always try to mail us. Yes. So thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity. So anyone who is interested in doing any research related to forensic, please do mail us. And any research work which is still unpublished and you want to really publish it in an index journal, can send it to our International Journal of Forensic Odontology. So thank you one and all. Thank you, ma'am. And I like to say that now we have opened our uh, Department of Forensic Odontology and MSc in Forensic Odontology program also. It's starting by the month of September 1st. And the fellowship program also we have started in the month of uh, September 2021. We are happy to announce that here. Yes, and uh, it's important to do some super specialization. Apart from our uh, postgraduate degree, it is now in this competitive world when all these opportunities are available, especially our university is coming out with different super specialization for you to be an expertization in that particular field. So if a person is interested in forensic and you have already started involving your research in forensic, you can improvise and expand your research experience utilizing such opportunity so we just thought that through this webinar we will create an awareness for people who are really interested in the field of forensic odontology so thank you one and all thank you thank you karpagalli ma'am thank you imelda okay ma'am we'll wind up thank you thank you everyone yeah thank you